Hey, rock stars, welcome. So glad to have you all here. I'm Lid Shaw. Thanks so much for joining us today for this workshop hosted by OWC and Recording Studio Rockstars titled Mixing Advice for the Home Studio. Today we have three wonderful Grammy winning mix engineers, Sylvia Massey, Michael Bronner, and uh, excuse me, Michael Brower and Dave Pensado, who will discuss the most important elements of mixing and how to get a professional sound consistently. I'm going to keep it really short in the interest of time and mention a few of the artists that they've worked with. Uh, Sylvia Massey has worked with Tool, System of a Down, Johnny Cash, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and many more. Yes! <laughs> Michael Brower, My credits favorite and bands. <laughs> John Mayer, Coldplay, The Rolling Stones, Aerosmith, Paul McCartney, and many others. And... Dave Pensado's credits include. I, I, hold on, hold on a second. I, I, sure. I, I can't take this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the odd guy here. Oh, well, Dave's doing the rest. <laughs> Dave, you've worked with Beyonce, T Pain, Mariah Carey, Kelly Clarkson, Michael Jackson, and just more than I could possibly list. So. And Sylvia Massey and Michael Brown. Right? With That's them. right. It's an honor to have all three of you here. Um, to the audience, a uh, reminder to please turn off your phones and, and really stay focused with us. This is going to be fantastic. Um, and please include your questions. We have some submitted early, but please include your questions. There's a question button in the chat so that we can make sure to get to them toward the end. And I uh, also just want to give a thank you to OWC for hosting this workshop. Um, yeah. OWC is just a fantastic source for fast drives, for composing and recording your music, and also reliability for your backup so you don't lose all your hard work in the studio. So yeah. welcome everybody. Very nice to have you here. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll jump in quickly and just kind of get things rolling because I know we got so much fun stuff to talk about. Um, and Sylvia, maybe I'll start with you. Um, say hello. Tell us where you are. And then, um, you know, the question that we could launch with is just what, what do we really need to mix? You know, the gear, the laptops, the speakers, the headphones. Oh my do God. A million dollar <laughs> studio. Yeah, that's, that's a big question and there's a lot of ways to answer it. Um, well, I, I've, uh, I've moved up to Oregon and I have a studio in Ashland, Oregon now. Actually a couple studios, but uh, the latest one is, is um, just uh, being built now. Uh, and it's basically a mix room with a, with a lot of different flavors um, that you can add into either mixing or overdubs or whatever. It's one big room. It's, I have a Rupert Neve um, 5088 and a Loop Trotter modular console. But honestly, the question about mixing, you, um, you don't have to have uh, an analog console for mixing. In fact, it's probably a big hassle anymore to have one, but I do hybrid mixing and it's very important that I sum out of the uh, digital recorder into um, an analog summing mixer. And then that just sums everything to stereo. And then I go back into the computer and print. So it does come out uh, into analog and then back into Pro Tools is what I use. But the, you know, I have a system here that is just killer for this. And I wonder if my little camera will show it. Let me just try, I've got the second camera here. Let's see if it's gonna work. I got a float. You seem to be surrounded by more than just a laptop and a pair of headphones. <laughs> yeah, I've got. Oh, yeah. And then we also um, can you see me in this camera? Are you are you able to see me now? It's kind of dark. Yes, it's a little yeah. dark, but uh, we did purchase a museum and it's an audio museum. Um, no, it's a, actually a microphone museum and I've got it up on display. Some of some of the mics on display over here on this side of the room. And I've uh, got some sexy chandeliers. And then I, you know, here's the, this is the Rupert Neve console and here's the loop trotter. But down here is the secret to the mixing that I, I do here. And it's a system made by dangerous music. And what I have are converters, uh, 16 channels of um, D to A converters. And then into the summing mixer, it's danger, dangerous music two bus plus, and then out of that um, stereo back into the computer. So it goes um, A to D again. And, um, and then uh, 
yeah, then I print and and it's just uh, such a great system. And I've learned a lot about um, because I went all the way in the box at one point and then I went back out and went back on the console. And now this just solves all the problems. Um, Michael and Dave, do you care to comment on that too? No, not after that. <laughs> Ooh, look at the time. Oh. <laughs> uh, Michael, save me when, when you need to come in. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, a while back, um, uh, maybe maybe six years ago, seven years ago, uh, my assistant Jason Joshua said, Dave, why are you using old equipment to make modern music? Why don't you try and use modern tools to make modern music? So I sold my NS10s and he never sold his, so I don't know what that says. But anyway, <laughs> I've been kind of trying to use that as a benchmark. I think that we live in, a, our music has always been influenced by the technology. So no 45, no Elvis, no FM radio, no, no Zeppelin, no, uh, no cassette, no so-and-so, no, no MTV, no Madonna. And so we have to ride that balance as engineers between mastering the, tech, the current technology and maintaining something for the audience that still has that groove and that feel and that emotion and the vibe. And Sylvia's brilliant at it, Michael invented it. And, and so it's not so much the gear as it is the song you get to start with, the song is everything. Well, yeah, and, and, of course. And, and then just go back to that time in life when you were six, seven years old and you heard, you heard that song your mom play or your dad playing it. You didn't know whether to shit or go blind. And you just you, all of a sudden your life had meaning and, and, and it was like looking through a, fr a, a frosted glass door and now you're looking through a clear glass and you know that's what I'm going to do, you know? And you talk to your parents and, 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 and I don't know, maybe, maybe that's not what everybody did, but um, I had the blessing of coming from a musical family, but I think that we're, we're, we're I think coming out of quarantine is going to be one of the, one of the remembered is one of the great moments in music. I think we've got a lot to, 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 to assimilate into our creative juices, you know, it's been tough on all of us, sometimes too tough, you know, but what a great medium to get it exposed to the, to the public, you know? Well, I think the, you know, when situations like this arise and, and the pandemic isn't the only time that we've had periods in our lives where we were forced to either sink or swim. And um, and our lives, I think as, as uh, artists, it's like a roller coaster. You know, okay, so, you know, maybe the first three months, none of us were working and then we were working, but you know, I've had summers where I wasn't working and everybody on the planet was pretty much healthy. You know? So, you know, and I had friends of mine that were very busy. Um, so it's, you know, for us, we were constantly wanting to trying to network and do our best work. And from that we get more work, but, you know, to, to address, where we're all mixing right now. The Sylvia's gone from analog to hybrid to in the box, back to analog and the hybrid. She's found the place because she's heard every one of these mediums. And now she's in a place where she goes, okay, I have all those options. I know how to work each one. None of them am I compromised by. I've taken it as far as I can. And this is what makes me happy. This is what allows me to envision the the story that the artist has given me right and for me and for all of us i mean if you think back when when we were all mixing at, to quarter inch and then we got a half inch and went <laughs> oh my goodness it's so much deeper and wider right and then and then somebody said well look at this washing machine it's called a 3m digital right and and <laughs> You know, I go, well, can I cut it? No, you can't cut it anymore. You know, there's no cutting this. And and so we adapted to that weird sound because it wasn't it wasn't analog. You know, we weren't pushing the the tape. We weren't, you know, 
it, it was like a whole other medium that we had to adjust to. And it was painful because part of the sound is, is the, the biasing that I would do. I always over biased and I, and I liked, you know, certain types of tape and at media sound we use, we were R and B. So we chose tape that had, you know, high, beautiful, lush sounds while rock and roll, you know, did the, uh, ATR, I mean, Ampex and, and, you know, and they had the ATR machines while we had the Studers. And then eventually recalls changed everything because somebody would come in, usually everybody attended the session. That was, that was as obvious oh as sliced bread. <laughs> then, and then suddenly some, you know, labels are going, ah, they don't have the budget. Uh, they're going to, you know, they'll, you, they'll call the, the notes in. And then a week later, and you've got your mix sitting on the desks going, well, wait a minute. And then they'd come in, you know, if, you, if we, they had the budget to come in and they had to make the changes right there and then, but then they, they changed their mind later and they need to pull up this mix. I was really good. I had great assistant we at times were able to get four songs in a day, but, but I mean, this was unbelievable painful because if I was done at 10 o'clock at night, they had to pull every one of those mixes back up until eight o'clock the next morning to do all the passes because there was no time for that. Right. But there was a point where, where we were saying, why am I going to half inch? Every one of these mixes is being redone. I've got, you know, there's thousands of dollars of half inch tapes. And then finally I made the decision. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to have one, one half inch rolling. And I'm just going to go from the half inch into Pro Tools or whatever, wherever, you know, a hard drive. And then eventually I was like, even this isn't worth it anymore, <laughs> but, you know, and then, but, but we were evolving because I grew up hearing the, the tape and the compression. And so when I was mixing and I was no longer using tape, I was putting things in so I could still hear it and feel it. And so we evolved. And then eventually it came to the situation and time where, where we, we wouldn't even recall a desk. We, after a song was done, we ran stems and that's what we call, we brought up. We never brought a, a mix back up on a desk unless it was some major, major rethinking and all the internal stems no longer applied. But that was, that became like 5%, 4%, 3% of the time. And now you're just working off of stems and you're, there is no more summing, like as you had mentioned before, it, it, you just got all of them. And we're used to that and of course, it allowed us to, to be more efficient. And that's what this was about because now you're getting comments 10 times in a row over a period of a month. You can't pull up a desk on that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then we learned techniques on how do you, you know, how do you, how do you do a quick recall? And, and then they got to the point where I was like, do I really want a desk? And then, but I was always the last last person on the block i i remember calling you dave scared shitless and and <laughs> calling nico bolas who even came to new york and and you know yeah. and tony and all you know everybody had already been doing hybrid i'm like yeah. but, but but how do you get that to sound good you know how do you how do you get the sweet spot there is no sweet you can't push you can't the control push. surface yeah <laughs> so that's so, the biggest was, challenge, yeah. You know, but I was still using my ABCDs. And what I realized that that sound was before I was entering the console. So, so when I went to a control service, I didn't really hear much of a difference because I, I was, the, my ABCD was the sound. It was before the, con and the console was actually bottlenecking it a bit. And when I didn't have that, it was straight through. It was like, boom. I was like, wow, this sounds really good, really fast, right? And the point is that we kept evolving and, and every time we would adapt something new and not only technically, but also musically, right? And so as mixers, we're constantly adapting, adapting, adapting. And you know the friends who, who didn't do that. You know the guys 
you know, who, who just didn't want to change. And where are they? You know, it, 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 you have no choice as a mixer or a producer, you know. So I, I think that to answer your question is, is that I think every time I've changed, I didn't change until I knew it was as good or better. And when it felt better, I was like, okay, I'm ready to move over now. This is no longer important to me. This is not a need anymore. This works fine because when I close my eyes, this song touches me. And that's all, that's all we need to do. We don't care. You know, the, the artist doesn't particularly care how that happened, mm. you know, what you used, just as long as it feels great. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's very encouraging, I think, for us because it, you all seem to agree that whatever works for us, if we can trust our own sense of whether it sounds great to us, then we're on the right path. Well, back to the, uh, the question about the equipment. Do you need a million dollars worth of equipment? No, but you need to spend money in certain areas. And I'll be very specific about it. Your monitoring is it has to be uh, something that you know that you can trust uh, because that's telling you, that's giving you the information for you to make decisions about your mix. So uh, if you're gonna spend money on anything, I mean, you could do mixing in the box entirely. You don't necessarily need a, a rack of analog summing or anything, as long as you've got a, a good system with some plugins, but those monitors are essential. So and you have, have to have an accurate room. Yeah, yeah. The room's more important than the speakers, probably. I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I would argue that. I mean, I, I use a system by G, uh, Genelec that has a GLM software that, you know, it adapts into the space. Yeah, so true. I actually move them from room to room, and I am in a giant room, uh, usually. And in my old studio, it was a, a, a without a control room. It's all one air, one big room, and I I'm very confident of my mixing in this space because of the GLM uh, adapting to the room mm. every time I need it. Well, that addresses it, that it, you know, you're addressing the room acoustics yeah. all in one. It's, it's like that Sonos. I don't know if the Sonos really works, but you know, when you take your phone and, and you're calibrating the Sonos to the room and it goes, boom, 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 boom. You know, and then suddenly you go, wow, this sounds good in here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> Michael, you were mentioning that the room you're in right now sounds pretty good. You know, when I built this room for the kids, it I put a, a flooring in. It's almost like um, it, it, it's almost like it looks like cork because, you know, they were like four four and eight or something they were always jumping off the couch and landing on their heads so i thought well it's really a good thing to at least have something to protect it and and my record collection is here also all my records are in front of me and so you know and i've got the couch that we would watch movies and stuff on and so you know when i moved up in march I was like, where am I going to, I didn't even think about the bass. Like, where am I going to put everything? And I thought there was a, my den, you know, I thought maybe I'll go in there. And I was like, man, the windows are just going to be, it, I, no, I can't do that in this room. And I thought, well, maybe this basement. And I thought, well, why not? If I move the table and I move this stuff and, you know, they're never, they're not here anymore. So, you know. And I took everything out of my assistant's room because he had he was all in the box. So I took the console, I took the um, the instead of my S6 because there was no room. I took I, I brought the S1s, and I brought of course my Benson delays, and I still have other analogs. I just haven't made it down the stairs yet. You know, it's these are steep stairs. Um, let me tell you something. And so, so anyway, I set up and I got my ATC 25s. Okay. And you know, when you've, when you've been doing this long enough, you can walk into a room and you can, your brain just starts to go, you know, it has to go here. A, the, this is too far from the wall. It's going to be a second reflection. No, it can't be this, you know, and, and just all naturally. And I just placed everything where it could be. And then I played a record that I know. And I was like, no way. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. That's great. You know, I was like, it, it took maybe three days to really adapt to it and trust it. Because then I had my, 
I was still, I was mixing on my Audi's headphones and other things, just, just to be sure. But, you know, I would, uh, what I, the first thing I did is I mixed a few things in and I send it to Joe Laporta and I go, okay, Joe, listen to this. Is the bottom whacked? Is the top whacked? Is the mid whacked? How does it sound to you? And he goes, I don't have to do anything. I was like, thank you. Wow. <laughs> you know, this yeah. room actually sounds good and I didn't do anything. <laughs> what are the chances? Um, Dave, could you could you jump in and comment a little bit about, um, you know, choosing headphones to mix in or, or speakers and, and just that same idea of how we can get our lows, mids and highs balanced when we're mixing in our homes? Um, well, I think I think there's several approaches Michael, Michael and Celia both kind of touched on. Um, my preference would be to just run out and buy some 703 and a couple pieces of wood and, and, and throw some shit around the walls and just and just make it ugly try and buy some fireproof uh, cloth. But this time um, I've been in this house maybe two months, three months now. And um, uh, I haven't really done a lot of treatment, but um, um, I've, I've, I've been using sonar works a little bit. Michael mentioned the Odysseys. I'm, I'm using the LCD X's. I'm using some, some headphones by us sounds and um, a couple of other things I can't remember, but um, but um, it's kind of like any port in a storm. I, I I've always I've always n never been able to judge my mixes, <laughs> so so I've always had uh, uh, somebody like Sylvia. Well, there's nothing like Sylvia, but somebody that's approaching Sylvia uh, to help me. And I look, is this is this any good? Is this any good? And and and. And so I don't, I, I, um, I'm kind of flawed in a lot of ways. I don't know how I got here, but um, there's something about music that, that if you just let it lead you, you'll get to the right point at some point. And then, and then I, I really enjoy going out to my car and listening. I really enjoy listening on my little MTMs, the, the IKs. I really enjoy my, um, my, my big uh, uh, Auspergers. I, I, I've got a lot of speakers to listen to. My favorites are, are little riff tones that are patterned after the R tones. I, I use those a lot. Um, but after it all goes around a little bit, uh, you, you, you learn a little tiny bit of something from everything. And, and then I reference a lot and I never reference any of my own mixes right. ever, ever. And, um, and so it just comes together. So, so there is hope for you guys at home that, 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 that don't have any treatment. But like Michael said, you have to find those those spots where where the the, the freak, it's like shooting pool. Pretend like you're shooting a pool ball, and then the the pool balls are like a frequency, and when they bounce off the rail, the the, the angle that they're going in on the rail is, is the angle they are coming out. And so, just draw it out in, in a little piece of paper, and I, I, my stuff is a little closer to the wall than I want. My stuff is uh, my speakers are closer. To, farther from my desk than I want, but those were the sweet spots. You walk around the room and, and you know that in this corner, you can listen to 40, 40 cycles. You know, in this corner, you can listen to 10K. And then uh, Michael and Celia, they know the old hallway trick where you just go out in the hallway and listen. And then, and then there was a time when we all took our R tones and put them underneath our SSL facing the wall. <laughs> and there was a time when Car mixes when, too. When, when we did all sorts of things. And oddly enough, some of the most expensive studios in the world don't have bass trapping. So so at Larrabee, that's one of my favorite rooms ever. It was a George Newburn room. But I had to go in the corner where the door was, which was Studio Three, and that's the only place I could hear 30 cycles. And I I, I like 30 cycles, you know. <laughs> but I don't like it too much because it takes over the whole mix. And that, that was the only place I could get it other than to have, have Eddie Schreier, one of those guys call me back and say, get that 30 out of there before you even send this back to me, you know? <laughs> so I you know you're all in three very different rooms. Do you find that, um, and maybe Sylvia, you want to answer this one to start, but do you find that people have a tendency to have, try and set up a home studio in a room that's too live, too much echo or too dead? Well, whatever space they have that that uh, that they can work in, I think is is doable. Um, I can tell from Dave from your voice just in our in our 
um, discussion that you're in a very live room. It seems like yeah, maybe there's no furniture in this room. This no is furniture and room. and probably no carpet, right? Is no, I just moved yeah. in. So like it, just a simple thing, like putting down carpet will help bring yeah. that down. Yeah. And or gaining that. weight. What's that? Or gaining weight. Oh, gaining weight because your your body absorbs the uh, yeah 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 I'm, I'm, the, I'm low like eight, <laughs> the low end the low end but uh, like you like uh like we were talking about the low end you know if the speakers are too close to the wall or too you know but w another thing is to pay attention to where you're getting your low end from uh, and um, like I have uh, some base extenders some woofer stands for these this Genlex system. And they were at first on the floor and I realized after doing references and like you, Dave, I, I don't listen to my own mixes when I'm re referencing, I'm listening to other people's mixes to just to calibrate my own ears to what I'm hearing. And then I realized that set, setting those uh, woofer stands on the floor was building uh, too much low end. It was, it was uh, exaggerating the low end. So now we've put them up on little stands and, and that has actually changed the the uh, the audible low end so that's how i'm able to really corner that and know what i'm listening to now um at least with the low end side of it yeah but um, also too, yes. you know guys i don't mean to jump in but uh like there are couches that you can put in the room and in the back of the room and it absorbs low end there's bookshelves that can dissipate the sound right now i'm in a room with no furniture i got a piano though and um, um, the whole house is going to be a studio, so it's not going to be a. It's, it's going to be my, my bedroom in the studio, uh, and I'm not, I'm not in any hurry to get anything going except in my room, in the little room that I'm using for my studio. But there's so many odd ways that you can, uh, like Sylvia mentioned, carpets. Um, I had a friend that that took uh, a, a sheet and nailed each corner to the ceiling, and then just threw fiberglass in it. <laughs> <laughs> because it made a big, a big like this, you know, and then, and then he just put fiberglass insulation in it. Of course, whenever the low end hit, he itched like crazy, but it worked. <laughs> He's probably you gotta on suffer, oxygen. You gotta suffer right for your art, you know. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, so let me let me uh, ask this question. This one is um, sort of, you know, again, you've talked about different hybrid techniques, and and Sylvia, you're surrounded by a lot of fun looking stuff there behind you um what would you guys say about balancing the creative side of mixing versus the technical just the playful side of mixing versus you know the the pre precision side um and sylvia if you want to begin with this one too and 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 just jump in well i like to understand exactly what's in the mix oftentimes i get sent files that i didn't record and so i'll investigate those uh, to begin with, I'll try to do a rough mix at the beginning so I know what I'm dealing with. And then I might have some ideas as, as I'm doing the first listens. Uh, and I try to make my first mix without listening to their reference mix because a lot of times clients will send their rough mix or another person's mix. And I don't want to be influenced by that necessarily. However, when I get the mix to a point where it's ready for the client to hear it, I'll, um, I'll listen to that rough. And if there's something really missing out of my, my mix, I'll add it back in. And a lot of times those special things that, that they do uh, in their, in their uh, rough mixes, um, they get, those get very sticky and they, it's hard for the client to, um, to not hear that. So I want to add that stuff in as well. I want to create my own little spinning uh, delays and, and, uh, and fun events um, through the mix just to make it more interesting and, and to make them feel like they're getting their money's worth when, <laughs> when they pay for me because I'm expensive, you know? So yeah, uh, there is that balance. Uh, I wanna make sure that I get, get the song to a point where it really delivers emotionally. That's the number one thing. Then I will give it a little sprinkle of some creativity somehow too just to uh, to make it special. Everyone's got to have something special. Uh, Michael, would you care to comment on that? I mean, you know, I, I know your mix is to have some pretty um, amazing uses of reverbs on the voice and just, just real spacious elements. Yeah, I, I've discovered over the years that there's 
there's two ways to mix a song. Um, there's the way that Sylvia describes where they just say to you, here, mix this song. We want you. We want, this is why we're coming to you. Uh, I mean, they often lie about that, but they, you know, for the most part, they go, this is what we want. We want your creativity. And then there's the other that I've discovered in the, probably in the last 10 years. And I, I coined a phrase, I called it may I. It's match <laughs> and improve because they don't care about how creative you are. What's happened is that they, their mixes, because now we've been in Pro Tools for you know a generation, two generations, it's an ongoing master, except that they're not mixers and they're 90% there. They just can't do the other 10% and they're forced to call one of us. And, and so there is definitely, they're not calling anybody. They're calling us because they've seen the records. They like the records we've done, but they really don't want you to reinvent the wheel on this. They love everything, but it's not a record. It's 10% off. And that's when I recognize that I go, all right, this may I, you know, this sounds like a may I, because you, what you want me to do, I think the best thing to do here is to match your mix and then figure out what that 10% is. And that's where we make the big bucks because that 10% isn't obvious. It's how we come up with that 10% because there's 90% ways of making it that 10% wrong. And now you're off by 20% and you're really <laughs> off, you know, you're ruining the mix instead of just matching and improving what is lacking in their mix. And in those situations, um, I, look, there's certain things about what I do, what I love, the, the kind of delays and the certain reverbs, but I could, you know, when I got that, that my radar is up, I'm, I got this feeling I'm going to go, man, they're going to say, turn off all those delays. We're happy. We want it exactly the way we wanted our vocal sound, you know? And I'm like, yeah. okay, but I can't help to do it anyway. You know, I, I'm not going to go nuts. You know, I'm not going to say, well, what do you, you know, I'll just turn it off. It's that quick, but I can't help. And it's like, kind of Sylvia says like, you know, get your money's worth. I mean, here, the, here are my ideas. But I think more and more people are just like, we're attached to our mix so much. We're not talking demoitis. We're not talking roughitis. We're talking about, we wouldn't even want to call you, except we can't figure it out on our own. <laughs> it's that kind of client, you know? And I'm fine with that. That's, you know, for me, that's easier. I mean, I know I've been matching mixes for years. I know how to do that, you know? And now all I got to do is come up with 10% as opposed to from scratch and come up right. with all new approaches. But I love that too. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm lazy. You know, it, it's, it, in fact, recently somebody said, well, I'm giving you all these stems. You know, I want mixing credit. I was like, <laughs> dude, I'm starting off where you left off. Those are just stems, Okay. <laughs> No, I'm not giving you mixing credit because you made a stem for me, right? <laughs> and so, and so, you know, there's, there's, th times are changing. I mean, I would have never thought that back then, you know, this is what it's come to. But to me, I think there's clearly two different styles and, and I enjoy both. And when I'm given that freedom where they go, Ah, oh, Brower, you know, just do that thing you do and we love it and the reverbs and delays. I'm so happy, you know, I'm so happy because it's so, it, it feels so free. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I leave these mixes and I'm just filled with energy and I, you know, it's not to say that I'm bummed when I'm doing a, a May I because I'm having fun there too. But, but I think, for all of us, right? I mean, when when you're just given free reign to just take this song and just interpret it your way where you become, you know, the, somewhat the artist on that, it's so gratifying. And, and you know, and, and what are you trying to do? I mean, I'm trying to bring out the story, you know, that the, the, the energy, the soul of this song that, that, and when the hook comes, you just go, 
<sighs> that's what I want to do. That's and, great. But, you know, when you try to do that where, you know, it's just the other day I mixed something where, where I was like, man, this rough is just so lame. I, 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 I get the idea, but I'm going to do my own thing. And, and my assistant, because we're all remote now, you know, my assistant is, is on a hundred and I don't know, 69th or something street and I'm out here, but, but we've got audio movers and we got team viewers. So he's here all the time and FaceTime, you know, sometimes I have to move him because he's like staring at me too much, you know, That's but, great. um, you know, and so I was like, oh, I was so excited. And he's like, wow, Michael, this, this sounds so powerful. And two days later, they go, the notes come back. They go, well, we really are looking way more like what our rough was, like what we, uh. we presented with you, you know, like we really want you to get back to that on the drum sound. And what's all the reverb and the delays on the vocal? We, we don't really want any of that. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, okay all right fine fine <laughs> and so i basically just pulled up when i always had my assistant match the the rough just to be sure that everything has been transferred properly right because that's the way you find out you don't want to find out as you're mixing that the guitar <laughs> sound it doesn't even exist because they they forgot to you know, they forgot to put the delay or the amp or whatever it is. And you got this tiny little, eh, you know, and so I said, okay, fine. I put that mix back up. And then I just started futzing around with a little bit and basically just improved a little bit their rough mix. And, and my assistant, you know, Fernando is like, oh man, I go, what do you think? He goes, well, have you heard your mix? You know, and I go, I can't. I can't go back and it? listen to my mix because, yeah. you know, because then I'm going to go, oh, this doesn't sound so good. But that's that's my problem, not their problem. Yeah. Their, their issue is that they want it more like their song. And that's our job. We're in a service business, you know. Yeah, you, so, you just can't be precious about it. You can't be precious. And I learned the hard way to, about being precious. Oh, my goodness. I learned the hard way. I would fight for what I thought was great. You know, what do you mean? You, what do you mean you want to change the drum sound? This song made me cry. I'm not changing anything. You know? And <laughs> then the it. label calls you later and go, uh, uh, Brower, we hear you got a serious attitude. And I was like, <laughs> I just, I'm saving the song, you know? <laughs> it's good to uh, know that's a universal pain point. You know, I think, I think. Uh, we're familiar with that that uh delivering the rough ultimately delivering the rough mix back to an artist um dave would you comment on that too um maybe i'll pivot to the next question uh what what to you makes a, a mix a great mix how do you know when your mix is done you know you're going through the mixing the creative and the technical how do you know when it's done um well, well can i can i can i get do one little, little thing absolutely okay uh, no one's ever hired me again because I was cheap or fast. So, so, so that's that's kind of a thing I do. And then I always do a creative call with the client. And the first question I ask them is, "Who do you want to buy this record?" Right. And you'd be surprised they don't have a clue ninety nine percent of the time. And then I ask, "What's your tolerance for me messing with the with the 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 the, um, the, uh, the demo?" I'm not really. I don't really like to to create the demo, if, if you want a demo, if it's so good, just put it out. You don't have to get me to use it, uh, to do it. And so uh, I, try to, I try to please the client because that's what we're, that's, that's, we're, a lot, we're a lot like a medical doctor, you know? You, you, you want your client to, co to, to go along with you, but you know what the song needs to, to live in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the limelight and make the people a lot of money. We're not, the, the three of us, we make people millions and millions and millions of dollars and, and you piece of shit come along and think that, that you, you know, that you can do the same thing at home without, it's, we don't sell our gear. We don't sell our, um, our, our skill. We sell our taste and, and our taste is, 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 I can't figure out why. I don't know why people buy my records. I just sit in my studio and make the record I wanted to hear when I was six years old and, and, or, or I find a way to, 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 to have a, a, a goal in mind 
but um, I ain't got no problem giving you your money back. I mean, we're cool, you know? And, and uh, um, so anyway, having said that, so the qu question I'm supposed to answer is what now? Oh yeah, when you, how do I know when- How do you know when you're done? Well, All I don't, so that's the short answer. Um, like, I'll drop some names, like, 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 when, like when I heard um, single ladies on the radio, I went back and did another mix just for me. And then when I heard every big record you've ever heard of mine, uh, Lady Marmalade, all these other big records, um, I, I don't want to do it, but I just can't help it. I was, um, cause it, there's always something like Sylvia and, 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 and Michael know, there's always something in a perfect mix that, that, that doesn't age well. And so you'll hear it like four or five months later and, and you got a new piece of gear and you got this and that. And, and so you tell your sister, pull it up and you just do, do your own mix. And, and I've given them to the clients cause I don't want to be, be that kind of person. Sometimes some of them make it out in the public, but uh, to, to be honest, um, I struggle with knowing when I'm through. Uh, I, I, I know that sometimes I might be going a little too far. You can feel it, but you don't want to admit it. And so you, you, you put that mix aside and then, then you wake up fresh the next morning and, and, and you hear those flaws. But, um, um, and, and then music changes. Every, every generation has its own culture and pop music is, is an outgrowth of pop culture. So whatever the culture dictates, that's, that's what you need to focus on. And that changes from time to time. And um, just, just look at reverb, we, you know, in the 90s that you'd have to hide your reverbs if you were using it in the early 90s. And now, and now, top end. You, know, now you need a snorkel to listen to some stuff. But, <laughs> um, snorkel. But, um, but the, you good. know you're done when, when you listen to it accidentally. So, 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 so sometimes I, I, I'll just make a playlist of the last two or three songs I've mixed and I'll just walk around the house or walk around the studio and just, and, and you, you hear glances of it and, and, um, and, and it comes to you. I, I think the hardest thing to fight uh, is your own, your own selfishness about what you did and your own success. So, so it's easy to tell that, that I use my success a lot because that's who I am. That's what I do. If you, if you don't, if, if you want to mix, listen to, listen to the, to the, uh, to the things that, that I'm known for. And, 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 you know, but I like challenges just like Michael and Sylvia. I, I've done, I've done mixes that, that I shouldn't have done just cause it would be fun, you know, and you, and you felt like the client was, uh, was it, would, would accept it, but, um, it's just music guys, you know, it's just music. And so, um, we're, 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 we're first and foremost, the three of us are musicians. And, and, and so we respect the music and, and, and we respect it through, through our, our, um, our, um, our work. Um, I, um, I, I like to put things in that are timeless, like, like vibe and groove and emotion. And I did a, I did a record for Mariah Carey, T uh, Jason Joshua and I did, uh, about 12 years ago, it's called Touch My Body. It was the number one record. Well, she goes on the internet and says, it's the 12 year anniversary of Touch My Body. And it went to number one again a couple of months ago. Wow. And, and it, didn't, it didn't go to number one because it was necessarily anything other than just people thought it was a new record, <laughs> you know? And so, so, so if, you, if you can train your ear and follow your heart, and, and, and immerse yourself in things you like and, and, and go, go to a museum. Creativity doesn't just come from another mix engineer. It can come from a great painting. It can come from reading Death in the Afternoon by Ernest Hemingway, or uh, it can come from any source. And, 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 and the best source is, is the two other people that are, that are on this panel. I, I, I study both of their, their stuff and I, 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 I borrow some creativity from them and uh, and so there's so many ways to know that you're through, and you're not never you're not ever through, and you're not you're always through. You know, it just depends on on where you want to stop. Like, um, so anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. There's a of. great museum to get inspiration from, right there with Sylvia. Right, yeah, right here. In the background. What's some of the stuff that really inspires you there, Sylvia? What's oh some, well, yeah. it, it's uh, in the in the process of mixing. Um, I'll work uh, like I am the client. I try to 
approach it like I'm the client and I'll do, you know, I'll get everything in a rough balance. And uh, then I take a uh, listen from top to bottom. I'm taking notes just like, a, you know, a client would. And then I, and I go through those notes and then I listen again and I make a few more notes. And then at the point when I feel like, okay, it's close to being done, uh, then I'll take a, and then I do my serious reference listening because I want to figure out like in the, in the question oh, we talked about was, um, who do you want to buy this, right? So I want to I want to put my mix in a playlist with with other artists' music that would be um, comparable sonically, not necessarily musically the same, but some kind of comparable playlist. Like it, it would be in a playlist. So I'm going to listen to those um, tracks, and then I'm going to A B my mix to that. If if it fits on that playlist, then I can say pretty much that we're done. I just want to make sure all the little um, T's are crossed and the I's are dotted in, in the basic mix. The, the, the challenge is to say, okay, it's done. Because honestly, the question, the, the, uh, the ideas never run out. You can keep going on and on and on. You can go past the point of uh, having a great mix and, and it will go downhill at one point if you keep working on it. So you have to be able to tell uh, yourself that, okay, that we're done. It's time for the client to listen. And if you've done all the references with other music and checking that demo at the last point, then you're probably in the clear. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a difficult thing. And finding inspiration from other people's mixes like Dave's and like Michael's uh, is so important because you really don't know where you are until you listen to someone else's work. So that's that, that's where I get it. That's very clever. The idea of using the playlist like that because it can inspire. Well, yeah. you know I have to, to think for. that way. Yeah. My approach is is a bit different, and I think this goes all the way back to when I was mixing at Media Sound. Um, I. When I'm done with a mix, I'm done with it. I don't suffer. I don't think, oh, what could I have done better? 99% of the time, it doesn't matter if you think it's done because it's going to be a thousand comments coming in anyway. So what does it matter, <laughs> honestly? But for myself, this is what, this is how I turned it around. I mean, I, I would... We at Media Sound, we had we generally had to mix a song in under two hours. That was the thing. If we didn't do that, it was just not cool. I mean, it just you know, it were like, how long did it take you to mix this album? You know, and so you learn how to make decisions quickly and then let it go. Like you do your best work and then you let it go. So it was a performance, and and the more I get, and this is why I love faders. You know, I perform and, and when, when it, I remember when I was learning a song, when I was in a band, there's a point where you get really nervous and then, and then it all comes together and then the band feels tight. And that's the way I'm doing now, except that I, it's, I'm not, well, I'm in a way I'm playing it. I'm learning all the parts and, and there's a point where I'm getting all the faders just in the right place and it feels good. And then I just go, you know, I go for it. And then. I'm not really thinking during this process. I'm just going impulse. It's just whatever comes to me, right? And then about the only time I start really thinking is when I turn the automation on because now I know what's going on and I made my moves. And then I have my little radio over here. Ah. It's this little Sony here where I've every record you've ever heard went through that Sony okay. box. And it's at a low volume maybe 65 dB or something in talking volume. And at that point, I can always tell if my mix is too busy because what mm -hmm. I think, it should sound very simple. I should only hear two or three elements, you know, like the, mm -hmm. you know, Bruce Sweden, rest in peace. He was the absolute king of that, right? There could be a thousand tracks and, you know, it always sound like there was only two at any one point. And so I listen to that and I go, oh, and that's when I start thinking. I'm like, 
you know, and, and I'm like, oh, wow, that, that sounds way too busy. I got to clear it up. But here, this is where I learned. Do you know, I know this has happened to all of you. So you know you, you're hearing this mix. It sounds just great. Then the client comes in. And he comes and he sits down and you you don't even hear your, you don't even recognize your mix anymore as you're listening to it. Because yeah. somehow your yeah. osmosis, you're moving it to his head. Now you're hearing the mix through his head. And through as, as the mix is playing, you're going, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. And then when the mix is done, you're, the guy makes those very comments that you were like, how did I, right? It's, it's, it's uncanny. Right. So I said, how do I stop feeling like that? And so one day I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to be the client. I'm going to make believe I'm the artist. And so I sat down and I'm listening to it as if I was the artist. And lo and behold, all these other ideas started to come to me <laughs> and I made the changes. And then when I, I couldn't think of anything more, I was like, okay, and I'm done. And then when the artist came in, those very things that I had addressed, he were addressed. He didn't say anything or he, she, you know, whoever. And, and I was like, bingo, I can finally stop feeling like I'm hearing the mix differently. And that was how I addressed it. And, and so I, I feel more freedom in that respect. I don't feel so nervous when, you know, but who, who comes in anymore anyway? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but I still apply that approach, you know, to, that's great to, as, as if somebody else was walking into the room and, and, you know, and it was a different sounding board and I've, I've been doing it for so long that I've learned how to become that other person who, you know, who has issues, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so. let, let, let me share this real quick. Vinny Cagliari, the great drummer uh, on uh, Rick Beato's show, said that uh, thinking is the biggest enemy of creativity that exists. <laughs> I'm, par I'm paraphrasing. And when you're when when you when you're not thinking and you're working alone, it, it's wonderful. But then when you chart out of that into thinking, is this good? Because the client walked in, you, you fall, I fall pieces. I, I, sometimes I leave the room, let them listen alone. Yeah. Well, that's Just, how I addressed uh, it because I was a nervous wreck. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it because every yeah. time the mix sounded different to me. And I was, I, I was like, how does that happen? Um, so I wanted to interject and just say, uh, this has been, this is great. We have a ton of questions from the audience and um, for time's sake, maybe we should jump right and start uh, presenting you with some of those questions. If you sure, guys remember sure. that. All right, so here's one. We've got some that were submitted early and some that are coming in the chats. This comes in from Mick Williams and uh, Mick says, when mixing, should we leave the top end sparkle to the mastering engineer? Is it better not to worry about the high end too much and stick to the natural tones that have been ca captured? Um, you know, for example, boosting the high end on a vocal. Um, Dave or, or Sylvia, if you want to start with that one. I'll take a rip, stab at it. Yeah. Um, my career started with a mastering engineer named Eddie Schreier. And, and when I moved uh, to LA in 1990, I didn't even know you could put something on the stereo bus. When, 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 when Sylvia and I were mixing together, I was like, I wasn't very good. But I had good taste, and I and I and I, and I knew what a good record sounded like. Mm -hmm. So, I would, um, I would, I would, I would work with one mastering engineer, like Michael said earlier, with Joe Laporta. And so, be, befriend a mastering engineer. Go go sweep at his place, or do whatever you got to do, and then get that feedback with one person all the time. But but try to do it all yourself, and and uh, you'll you'll never you'll never. Well, never is a strong word, but it's hard to grow when you don't take those chances and try to do things yourself. And, and you can do it. You just got to try it, buddy. It, it just takes a few minutes. We all screwed up lots of mixes on the way to, to where we got. And uh, But you want to be a mix engineer. And, and we're, we're rapidly going into a time period where um, I, I, 
mastering is, 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 is not the same as it used to be. It used to exist so that you could take a piece of tape and convert it to a piece of vinyl. But I would never, ever, ever not have a relationship with a great uh, mastering engineer. And, and sometimes one or two or three, but um, yeah. um, I think I think he's I think he's overthinking it a little bit. It's just music, man. It's, yeah. it's all it's Greg, a theory. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. It's just there. And, it, and, it, and it, it's Greg stuff Calby there. was my was my greatest teacher. Greg Calby, wow. the legendary mastering engineer, he was at mm -hmm. Sterling. And I mean, the first ten years, uh, up until labels decided that you didn't have a choice on who who should master your record. Up until mm -hmm. that day. Greg mastered all my records and every time, and I was recording and mixing at the time, not just mixing and, and I would bring it to him and he would say, well, you know, I, on the next record, you know, your bottom end needs to go a little lower or your top end or your mid range, he would make comments. And yeah, then yeah. four weeks later, I'd be, I'd have another records. We were making albums, albums were done usually within four weeks, mm -hmm. soup to nuts. And four, six weeks later, I bring him another record. And I go, how do is how is that? He goes, oh, that okay, that's better. But now we do this. I learned so much from Greg. So I mean, you know, and and to this day, even with you know with Joe Laporta, if uh, it, it yeah, it's so important to to uh, to find a master engineer that you trust yeah. that isn't going to take your mix and implode it. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like the same comment you guys made about um, mixing against a rough mix. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. No, I try to invent the wheel. Reinvent the wheel. <laughs> you are trying to invent the wheel. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, there's, a, there's an approach that I take in uh, when I finish a mix, I do put compression and EQ across the stereo bus, usually with an isotope uh, ozone plug-in or something like that. And, and I do that for a couple of reasons. I want to actually bring up the level. I know this is something we should probably be talking about. The level, I want, I want the client to have a healthy level so it jumps out of the speakers. I also want it to have a finished sound. So I'll add compression and I'll, and I'll, add, uh, I'll do some, some EQ um, to kind of shape the low end and maybe take out some mids to give it a good smile. Now, when it's time to to, when we get approval on that, that mix, then I'll, uh, I'll take the, uh, the stereo bus processing off and I'll print the non-processed for the mastering engineer. And then that goes um, to get that same kind of treatment perhaps. Uh, but yeah, I, it's, it's hard for me to give a client a mix that I know will change in mastering uh, and, and uh, you know, because it'll sound dull and weak, you know, I want it to sound like it's finished. So that's the, the approach that I take. But I'm learning all the time still. I mean, it's, it's a uh, never ending um, uh, education. Fantastic. Um, okay, here's a question that comes in from David Bertman. And uh, David asks, for the less experienced mixers among, amongst us, can you review what levels and what kind of compression and EQ you use on songs that make them sound great? In other words, how do I mix so the music seems nice and loud but doesn't overpower the vocals? Um, Michael, would you like to start with this one? Oh, I was hoping Dave was going <laughs> to answer that it, one. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the time. Oh. Yeah, Michael, how would you handle that? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems so irrelevant because I, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the song. You know, and what comes out of this song, how should this be presented is how the loudness and the dynamics and the bottom end and the brightness, you know, if, I, if I'm doing a record that should really feel warm and natural and more in a club, I'm not gonna, you know, polish it and hype it up. But if it's, if it's really more of a uh, pop record and the, and the vocal should be, you know, bright and and pushing and and really driving the whole song it can't be duller than the symbols i mean it it who who do you want to listen to because right. whatever is bright is what your ear is going to go to so if it's the vocal the vocal should be brighter and and if you're noticing the symbols you should turn the the eq down 
in the in the area of the cymbals so that it's not conflicting with the vocal. Um, and so, but these are all things that kind of happen subconsciously because you're just trying to get the story out and get the vibe mm. and the excitement going. And and again, as Dave, you know, all of us have said, there's there should be no thinking going on during this process. You're not analyzing what you're doing. You know, it, it's not like, hmm, let me see now. Let me think about this button and what should this should? <laughs> I mean, you know, do you think, uh, I always say this, it, a musician when he's on stage, right? And he's got his eyes closed and he's playing, right? He's not thinking, he's just being. And as a mixer, that's the same thing we are. We're just being. You don't see a, you don't see a guy on, on stage going, hmm. <laughs> hmm. You know what I mean? There's no time for thinking. <laughs> you know? it's, things are going too fast. And, and when I'm mixing, I'm not, there's no time for thinking and analyzing. It, I, you know, I, I'm just, I just want to get, I get on a train. I want to get off at the right stop. That's basically it. You know, I just want, I just keep moving stuff and things. And if it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. I'm not, I'm not, I, it, everything is like neutral attitude towards everything while I'm just expressing the song. And then at some point, there's always that point where I just go, oh, I'm in. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and that takes and, and that can happen in about it, it, it goes bang. And it, within a minute, suddenly your body reacts and you get the chills and you go, oh, I'm in. What did I just do? What just happened 10 seconds ago? I don't care. And I keep going, right? But I'm in, and that's what we are always searching for. But you can't, you can't find it if you're looking for it. <laughs> you know, it just has to be. You just are expressing the song, and you're mm -hmm. just, you know, you just bringing the energy out. And at some point, it happens. Now, if 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 by making the vocal louder or brighter or making the kick nastier or you know whatever you're you're doing and and making it louder suddenly squeezes everything in a sense that just gives it excitement then that's the right decision and if it isn't it's the wrong decision you know but what's it based on it's it's what does this song want from you yeah I have um, some very specific things about uh, mixing to, to uh, talk about as far as like you're talking about vocal and bringing out a vocal. First of all, if you're recording the song yourself, be sure that you don't record a bunch of instruments all sitting in the same frequency range as the vocal, for one thing. Or, uh, you know, if you've got uh, loud, distorted guitars, you've got a screechy vocal and you've got cymbals going constantly, you're going to have a tough time sorting it all out later. So I suggest that as you're recording, you start recording with an idea of how the mix will set up. And, and so uh, there's extremes to this, you know, I want to have a nice halo around the vocal. So I'll, um, I'll get into real details about uh, you know, rides on the vocal, I'll get into super detail and actually draw in the volume changes on certain words just to, okay, that word needs to come up, you know, this breath needs to be brought down. I'll do DSing, but oftentimes it's better uh, and sounds more natural to have, to, to just um, gain, just change the gain on uh, waveform so that it's a lower level on just the breaths or something like that, or do another volume ride. Uh, but yeah, in extreme instances, I'll actually um, duck uh, the cymbals behind a vocal with keying off the vocal or using a, just a soft ducking to, to make sure there's a halo around the vocal. Anyway, those are a few things, but, but yeah, really it's like you just, you listen to it and then you just keep working it. And then all of a sudden it just comes right together. Like a d dynamic EQ could be very useful for something. Dynam like that. Yes, dynamic EQ. Or just um, put a de on the symbol. 
What's that? A de on, on the symbol. Oh, you know what? I haven't done that. I'm going to try <laughs> that. See, I'm always learning. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, okay, here's another question. This one comes in from Joe Blassingame, um, and he wants to know, uh, knowing the most important tool is the audio engineer's um, Oh, excuse me. Knowing the most important tool all audio engineers bring to the job is the ability to hear with great focus on detail of the music. Um, advise on the long-term measures for overall hearing protection and short-term measures you incorporate before starting a mix session. Um, maybe, Dave, do you, would you like to start with that one? Not really. It's just, okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? I kind of dozed off for a second there. I think it's a good question, by the way. I'm, I don't mean to be, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but no, I, no, it's all right. I, I don't know how I, I, I dozed off. I'm looking out the window and then I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> okay, repeat, I'm sorry. Repeat it one more time. I think it was essentially, um, you know, the, the, the idea of are we listening loud? Are we listening quiet when we're mixing? How do we sort of keep our hearing so that we can make good judgment calls? While we're working. Well, uh, from, from age about 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 to about age 31, 32, 33, I sit on a stage with uh, four, Marshall, four Marshall stacks, you know, and uh, uh, there's nothing greater in life than to take a, a humbucker and plug in on a Gibson uh, 59 and just put in a Marshall and just hit an A chord and have that, that 442, 21, just vibrate your body. And it's just, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. And amazingly enough, I can still hear. Um, I think that, uh, um, damn, I forgot the question again. Come on, Liz. Just for, just um, speaker levels, you know, do you guys oh, yeah, yeah. like to mix yeah, yeah. Very quietly I, while you're I, working? Or? We, we all do it different. We all do it different. For me, I can judge, uh, mixing has, has, a, has a big balance and ratio component to it. And so if you're constantly turning the, the, the volume of your monitoring up and down, for me, that's really hard. I know people that can do it, but I, 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 I always use the same volume for, 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 for quite a while. And then I might alter the volume when I'm working on drums or I might alter the volume when I'm at the final part of the mix where everything has to be like spaghetti sauce, all the, all the flavors together. And so, and so, um, there's all kinds of people. I've known people that uh, great engineers better than me. They 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 would mix really low. I, I know great engineers that that I had a, I had a client that actually was an engineer, but he was a producer. But he, he caught my my 15 inch woofers on fire. He was listening so loud, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and and we've all seen people you know blow the white cones out of our NS10s, you know. Uh, I like I, I prefer to I, I prefer to listen loud, but I try to do that with a little bit of control near the end of the night. I, 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 uh, when I think I'm getting close to the end of, of of my session, I like to just have fun for me, and so I'll play I'll play a bunch of stuff and and listen. And then when I go in the morning, I do the same thing. I I might I might be doing a hip hop record, but I might be playing um, a pop record. You know. Um, the one thing that, that's for sure is there's as many ways to do things as there are engineers in the world. And, and uh, an extension of that, if you go to the doctor, you don't get a podiatrist to help you deliver your baby. They're specialists. And so if, if you're trying to pick an, an engineer, there's, there's, we're all different, you know what I'm saying? And so, so you listen to what they do, you like it, let them do what they do. And, and, and so, um, um, our profession is, is, is I, I wouldn't be here if it, if it weren't for that. It saved, it saved my life and I'm being dramatic, but I apologize, but man, life ain't worth shit without mixing records, you know? <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just what you do and it just, it just oozes out your pores after a while. And um, Hallelujah. so many ways to do things. Stop focusing on the ways to do things and just do things. If you haven't sampled, like Brower said earlier, if you haven't sampled uh, multiple ways to do something, then then how can you do something? You know, you don't, you don't know what's there unless you try it and then you select what worked for you and what worked for you today doesn't work tomorrow. You might have you might have a mic on somebody and you think you think you've changed the world and then they come in the next day and the mic sounds crappy and then you try it the next time you see or him or her and the mic sounds crappy. It's, it's a fluid thing that you have to, it's a little dance that we all do, you know? 
Um, okay, so we have about four minutes left um, on our planned time, uh, but a ton of questions. So maybe uh, maybe we'll just go quickly on a couple more. Um, this one is asked directed towards Sylvia. Uh, it's asking again about why is analog mixing even relevant? Is the question a hard question here? <laughs> is this a preference or are there solid technical reasons? You all have begun to discuss this, but if you want to continue on analog versus digital and you know why we why and how we make those choices, there's a very important reason why um, I want to go back out into analog and and it's the, for headroom purposes. When I was mixing in the box. Everything sounded claustrophobic, uh, so squashed and uh, brittle, and it was hard to actually bring a focus into one thing or the other because it, you know, you bring one thing up and pushes out everything else. So what I discovered that, you know, and I wasn't getting that when I was mixing on my old vintage Neve, I, I wasn't getting that pinched sound. So uh, what I do now when I work in Pro Tools. The first thing I do with files, as I set up my uh, session in a template, is I turn down all the files. And this is might sound crazy. I'd love to hear what um, the uh, the other mixers on this call are doing. But I bring down my levels minus 20 on all the tracks. And then suddenly, and that, that's my starting point. Now I can bring it up. I can bring this up. I can bring this up. But I've got so much room to move. And, and when it goes out into analog, then um, it also has that headroom and it just sounds more open. I, uh, honest to God, that has been the biggest thing to improving the way that I mix. And I, I, I love the mixes that I do today. You know, uh, I love them way more than uh, when I was mixing full analog on the old console. I, I just think it's, a, it's great to have these tools available now. Uh, Michael, would you care to comment on on that? Yeah, I, I agree. As a matter of fact, I have a trim that mm -hmm. Fernando set mm -hmm. up for me. And if I just turn that down, everything, everything globally goes down. And I there's two places where I do that. I can do that on the individual tracks. Mm -hmm. And I can also do that. I have everything is assigned one through seven is assigned to eight. So I've got on seven, I have my drums. So I've got my submaster. My drums are on seven, that's drums and bass. And then guitars are on six, you know, mm -hmm. and I have all these sub, but they all go to eight. And because I'm mixing into compression with the ABCD stuff, if I feel like I'm pushing those, you know, those sub stereos a bit too much, I'll automatically, even if I think I'm doing great, I'll bring it down, 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 and then I'll see it where it wakes up because sometimes it actually gets louder as you're bringing it down because it's pushing, because I'm mixing into compression and maybe I'm pushing these compressors a little too hard. So by bringing that down, it opens it up and that pinching thing that Sylvie refers to, it can happen in two places. And, and I think if, if you're getting files that are just jamming to begin with, my headroom is too small at this point. And so by bringing one little trim, I don't have to go individual. I just bring one and everybody comes down to the point where I feel like it's, I have more headroom. Um, I mean, generally Fernando kind of sets it up that way for me to begin with. So I don't have to think too much about that because that's why I like it. But with the, with eight, eight I do every day. I always want to bring it down. Maybe I need to bring it up. I, I, I want to do something because again, I'm always working in compression to make things sound bigger, not to control, not to make, you know, to, to do anything, but to make something more dynamic. And so there's a small window. And if you're not in that window, things either are feel dead or they're squashed. So by doing that, um, that really, really addresses the, uh, the issue. And, you know, look, I was very happy hybrid. Um, I'm very happy in the box right now because I've been able to find exactly the same compressors and EQs that, you know, that UAD or Plugin Alliance has made or SoftTube. You know, the, today's equipment is so musical. It's not like the old days where the only thing that looked like the piece of gear was the GUI. <laughs> you know, 
Yeah. And and now it's like they really are mu- the the guys who are making this stuff, they're musicians, they're musical. They they're not thinking about they're not looking at graphs and numbers. They're using their ears once they, you know, before it ever comes to us. And and you can tell that they're doing this because because it feels musical. I can push a plug in. There would it was a time if you pushed a plug in, it went. You know? yeah. you so, push it to do that. so we've we've sort of hit the end of our plan time um do you can we do one final question a closing question or you guys let me know if you want to continue but yeah Fine, um keep going okay great this is uh this one comes in from richard klingman and richard says uh do you typically eq every element of mix to make it work or are there um some elements you just leave as is so i think maybe just the question of do you sometimes just leave something alone in a mix or does something always get a little bit of love oh yeah and well if i get a chance to record what i'm mixing then i i pay attention to each instrument each track and i'll eq on the way in so it's committed i don't wait until mixing to to make those changes but if I bring, if, if it's, you know, you never know what you're going to get with another client. So um, I'll work uh, and add EQ and compression where it's needed, but not necessarily on everything. Dave, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, um, I'm not trying to brag or, or, or say anything other than just the truth. And that's, I've listened to so much music in my life and different kinds of music. Uh, I'll listen to the rough mix two or three times and I know exactly what I want it to sound like. Exactly like within to just, I cry if I can't get it to sound like that or I'll quit. But um, having said that, I don't make my decisions whether something needs to be touched or not with EQ or with compression. I'm, I, if, it, if it sounds like I want it to, it's in my head, not, not touching any equalization is the same thing as equalizing it. You just, it's, it's, it's part of the same thing. It's not, it's not a separate uh, thing. And every once in a while, um, uh, things don't work the way you want. And, you, and so you, you, you go to compression. Just, to, just an afterthought, um, I, I've, I've been using less uh, EQ to change the sound and I've been using more saturation and, and mm. uh, and, too. and uh, distortion and clipping and like like there's so many great tools out there now it all started a long time ago with uh, culture vulture thermionic culture vulture, culture vulture we all learned how to use remember guys we remember how, how, and so going into the future i think into this pandemic i think that that's that's something that we should we should start using more so so um yeah that's that's what i do Wonderful. Um, here's a question that's actually directed towards you, Michael. This comes in from, let me see if I can get the name there, Randy Ragnini, I think I think is maybe who's asking it. Um, he says, uh, I purchased your Drama 1968 Mercenary Edition FET compressor from the nice folks at Alto Music. Nice. I thought I read you used it for drum room tracks. Is this so? And how are you accomplishing the same function with plugins if you're mixing in the box? Yes, a lot of gear that I have in my rack, once I found a, a sweet spot, I never touched it again. It's like my pies on the toms from 10 years ago, I found this setting and that's their home is a good explosive tom. I don't think those poor pies have seen anybody else or heard anybody else in all those years, except for toms. And mm. the drama was the room. I put that across the room, but I had three different types of room compressors. There was that nice to be warm one that the drummer did, and it just took the room and just opened it up and just, it was like, ah, ta -ta, you know, and then I mm -hmm. had another one that was, you know, that would just kind of smack it a little bit more. And, uh, and then I had another one that, that was kind of in a curve and it, it, the harder you hit it, it you wouldn't it wouldn't accentuate the the symbols so you could you know tune it so that the symbols would come down and the room would come mm up um how do i do that in in the box now it's boy there's just so many different i can use 
Um, I'll use the Abbey Road TC, uh, I think T TG mastering compressor or it, it, that thing is a hog. I mean, you have to, you, you do it and then you print it <laughs> right away because <laughs> there's no power left for anything else, you know. But um, in other times, the one that I've been using for a, a while now, I love it so much is uh, Plugin Alliance, a black box. Um, we're working on a new one now that's going to have MS and stuff, and it's going to be really cool. It's whatever. First of all, you got to listen to what the room sounded like when you got it. I'm not recording any of these. Sylvia has to total control how her records are going to be. Yeah. She's, she's working on them. You know, yeah. she doesn't need Hopefully. to do shit to them once they're done, you know. <laughs> That's and, right. You know, and it's like, I mean, for me, I, I always remember when I would get tracks from, you know, from Joe Ciccarelli, I go, oh, this is going to be a great day, man. I just got to put the tracks up and I'm done you know and you know great engineers like sylvia and joe and others it just mm -hmm. makes our lives so easy but that, that is not the norm you know if <laughs> i can get a track from sylvia and first of all why would i because she'd be mixing it but <laughs> if i you know if i did i'd be like baby ooh, we're i'm in today you know my <laughs> my mix is going to sound fantastic because i'm already working with great work but if, you know, if the room sounds like it needs something, then by all means, uh, then I decide, well, what, what do I need? And if I, what do I need? Well, which toy do I need to put on to get what I have in my head? It's basically exactly what Dave is saying. You know, it's like, I, I'm not thinking much more than that, but I have a scan of, it used to be hardware. Now it's software. I'm like, okay, this is this. And then I kind of think about, you know, some of the compressors, the plugins that I have, but there's millions out there. It's overwhelming. So I'm, you know, <laughs> whatever ones I think about, I'll choose between those or I'll use Manny sometimes, you know, the Manny oh, distortion can be great or it can be, who knows? It's like, you know, the culture vulture is always a go-to. It's always sitting there in my favorites. You never know. It just depends on what you started with. But um, yeah, that drama was a sweet, sweet sweet compression plus the meters would turn red as the volume gets louder is that the 1960 yeah 69 90, uh, the 69 yeah and i misquoted That's, that was uh that was chaz root who was who was asking the yeah. question on that one yeah and so as you hit it harder the whole the whole meter would turn red wow oh, Awesome. Oh, I'd disconnect that. I want. I mean, <laughs> that drive me crazy. I come from. The, I come from the days of the redder the better. <laughs> the redder the better. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we're 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 well over time. Uh, uh, Sylvia and Dave, do you have any any favorite anything that you found a plugin for that has sort of been a go to for you in the similar way of the drummer was for Michael? Um, oh God. Tough question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots, the, right? The micro pitch shift, uh, the sound toys, is is a great uh, bundle of uh, plugins. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of very useful things. And so if I want to stereoize something that's basically a mono track, I, I'll go to that. That's that's one that I use a lot. But honestly. Uh, I try to use as few plugins as I can. And, and the way I do that is I group all the tracks into uh, different uh, subgroups. So the drums and the bass and the guitars and all that. And then I globally uh, affect the, the group with an EQ or uh, compression. So, uh, and then, then, then uh, each group also has its own special effects that only work for that group. So I try to keep everything a little bit separate and it, and it, it saves on uh, the power to, to, to have fewer uh, plugins. So that's, me, my, that's my final. Oh, thanks, thanks, Sylvia. For me, um, um, my plugins change a lot uh, on, on, all the time. I, 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 I'm mad at myself because I'd like to st stabilize things, but there's nothing better than waking up on Christmas morning and opening a present that you really wanted and that's what a new plugin does for me. And it just changes my whole life and makes the day better. But my whole career in LA, I used an EQ4M made, at that time it was called an NTI. Uh, a dear oh, friend yeah. and brilliant, right? brilliant, brilliant guy Man. was uh, 
that made that was uh, Cliff Mogg. And, and now mm -hmm. I use his, his single rack space EQ4M. The, the one we used to use, Sylvia, with an 18 dB a headroom. Now this has got like 28 or something. Oh my God. So I, I use that. I use that on every mix. It's, 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 it's so musical and, and, and the heart of the person that made it comes through the speakers when you use that piece of and gear. And it's blue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Blue. And then I use, uh, I, I use uh, Greg Scott's um, Clarifonic a lot. Uh, sometimes on on a, on a on a sub bus, and then I use um, Matthew Lane's um, um, his his hardware. Um, God, I can't remember the name of it. It's the hardware piece of unit that he makes. Um, spacecraft, uh, yeah. and it's a, it's a it's a an analog widener, and it's really really good. And then and then old school Eclipse from Eventide. I, I usually have it on the real chorus. And that's what you hear on a lot of my vocals. And those four things are just about on every mix. If not, they're they're there to 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 to, to give service whenever I need them, though. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> so they're always ready to go. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you all of you so much for joining us here today. Um, we've got lots of questions uh, to everybody who's watching this. I've, we apologize that we couldn't get to everything. Hopefully. We covered a lot of those in all the things you guys were talking about. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you. And before we go, can you guys let the let the rockstars know where, where should they go find you? Where would you like them to come say hi? Sylvia, we forgot to mention this. I just oh, got this yeah. and I'm so excited about it. All right. Yeah, that's the book that Chris and I wrote and it's fun. And Dave's in there and I think, Michael, are you in there too? I think so. I'm, I think I'm so. Not sure. yeah. I think he is. Yeah. You yeah. guys have your own tarot cards in here, I think. Uh, right, right. So, um, yeah, yeah. I've always been a big fan of Robert Crumb and, and Daniel Klaus oh. and cartoon styles like that. Well, so. uh, you can buy it. it at, I have a shop. It's shop.sylviamassey.com. Wonderful. Well, Sylvia, thank you for being here so much. Um, Michael, where would you like to people to come find you and uh, where should they go to check out your, your wonderful work? Um, I'm on www. Uh, M Brower, I think <laughs> something simple, and uh, on Instagram it's Michael Brower underscore somewhere in there. Um, yeah, That's about it. Well, that, and then also um, we forgot to mention uh, uh, Rockstar's Michael is um, one of the founders of Mixed with the Masters. So yeah, um, yes. Please go check that out as well. It's great, great another place to learn. Yeah, um, and then time, Michael. that was a great time. Yeah, uh, Dave. Of course, you have Pensado's place. You're you're OG for teaching exactly. us how to do this stuff. So like uh, please let the rock stars know where they can go find you online. Where would you like them to go uh, learn uh, more? Well, I'm real proud of Pensado's place. I think it's um, it, it's a labor of love for me. I, I don't really make any money myself off of it. I want it to always be free. And then I have a gifted partner, Herb Trowick, and. Um, uh, the best staff out there. We've got a really good staff. Uh, and then uh, I have some, I have some in, into the layers floating out there. We call my ITL sometimes. And I haven't done any because of the quarantine, just kind of missed me up a little bit, but, but I'm gonna hit you with a barrage of a lot of new into the layers. So keep an eye out for those. And, 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 and the comments, leave me some comments, you know? They, 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 I, I like the ones that start, Dave, you ignorant piece of shit. I like those the most, I always <laughs> start with that. That's fantastic. Well, thank you all. It's just I, I'm incredibly honored and um, nervous as hell the whole time. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And um, I actually did make some playlists of music from all three of you. So I'll try and share those with everybody so they can go check out all your records. It was a huge pleasure for me to go listen to them all. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.